Welcome, early American literature friends. This is a short discussion of William Byrd, the William Byrd text from History of the Dividing Line. Uh, in the book, this starts on page 538. Uh, there's also a link to it in D2L uh, that asks you to jump down to the bottom of page 49, which is where it starts in the book. This is really just, uh, this little excerpt gives you a short scene from William Byrd's History of the Dividing Line. And what he is describing is their expedition. Byrd lived most of his adult life, especially the later portion of his life in Virginia. He owned a huge amount of property in Virginia. Um, he owned this giant plantation that was really like five plantations combined. It was like five farms combined into this massive plantation. Um, he took, his father was a wealthy landowner in Virginia, um, William Byrd I. Byrd himself was born in 1674. His father sends him back to London to be educated. Um, he li he is, uh, lives his young life in London, but then comes back to the United States and comes back to Virginia um, in 1726, and he lives the rest of his life there, managing and running this massive plantation. And he loved Virginia, and he loved, as much as he had enjoyed growing up in London and going to school there and being trained there, um, he really found the joy of his life living um, in Virginia running this plantation. If you read other sections of this, there is obviously a dark side to William Byrd's plantation because he owned a massive amount of slaves. The plantation was really run, really the work of the plantation was done by slaves as much as William Byrd oversaw it and was interested in the day-to-day -day running of it. And even in parts of the diary, he talks about getting medical attention for the slaves and taking care of them and making notes about who's doing well and who's not. But there's no getting around the fact that he was a slave owner in colonial Virginia. That's the other reason that he is interesting for us. Um, it's the time period that he lives in and uh, um, Virginia. Uh, we've, we've seen John Smith and the founding of the Jamestown Colony um, by the Virginia Company. You get to, and then we've gone up with William Bradford and Mary Rowlandson. Uh, Mary Rowlandson's life overlaps with William Byrd's. You see though, that this gets us back to the Virginia of John Smith, but the world has changed a lot from, you know, 1609 to 1674 to 1744. Um, and Virginia is established as a wealthy colony now. Um, it's a wealthy British colony. And that's the other important part is you see here, William Byrd dies in 1744. You're still, you know, 20 years away from the American Revolution. And so Byrd exists for us um, and for himself Bird exists as this document of the thriving British colony that doesn't, that during his lifetime, most people would have never thought about America you know, becoming the United States and being its own independent country uh, instead of being a British colony, which is what it was. Bird very clearly saw himself as a British subject and a British citizen and a, and a resident of Virginia, the place, but, but also Virginia, the British colony. Um, and one of his duties, we're reading from History of the Dividing Line, and one of his duties as a member of Virginia, the British colony, he is assigned to and accepts the job of surveying what eventually becomes the state line between Virginia and North Carolina. If you look at Virginia and North Carolina on a map, they sort of look like mirror reverses of each other, and that is because that is how um, Byrd did the survey and he essentially took what was then understood to be Virginia and s split it in half, making Virginia and North Carolina, or what becomes Virginia and North Carolina. And the history of the dividing line tells the story of that surveying trip. And he gives you a little bit of this excerpt here. You see Bird here. Um, and he is always dressed in what were the um, popular in the Enlightenment, popular clothing and style of the day, the, the big wig, um, the, the velvet uh, Westcott, which is what they would have called it. Um, and then you see him in this, in this other portrait here, same thing. Um, shirts back then did not have collars. And so you change collar, like you would have a stylish collar, you change collars the way people, the way men now change neckties. You see him with the shirt, the fancy collar, the Westcott, that's just like 
he is designed he is um made to look like a wealthy upper class planter british citizen um in both of those portraits what he describes in history of the dividing line like i said is that expedition to survey what becomes the state line between virginia and north carolina the thing that is most interesting to us in the excerpt that's in the book is uh, that what he gives you in the, the first, there's really two halves of this excerpt, and what he gives you in the first half is this, their whole, the guide for their entire surveying trip is this Native American whose name is Ned Bearskin. And what you get in this excerpt, we encamped about two miles above, beyond the river, the Dan River, if you know where that is in Virginia, where we made good cheer upon a very fat buck that luckily fell in our way to shoot a deer. The Indian, and that's Ned, likewise shot a wild turkey, but confessed he would not bring it to us lest we should continue to provoke the guardian of the forest by cooking beasts of the field, birds of the air, together in one vessel. Common practice among the Native Americans is to not combine beasts of the field that walked on the ground like buck, like deer, with um, birds like turkey. You can see, you can compare this, and Bird very clearly sees some kind of correlation between this and the sort of um, the Jewish tradition of the kosher and non-kosher foods and the sort of things like that. This Indian, this instance of Indian superstition, I confess, is countenanced in some measure by Levitical law, again the the Hebrew Old Testament, which forbade the mixing of things in different nature together or in the same garment, and why then not in the same kettle? But after all, if the jumbling of two sorts of flesh be a sin, how intolerable an offense must it be to make a Spanish oleo that is a hodgepodge of every kind that is eatable? And the good people of England would have a great deal to answer for for beating up so many different ingredients into a pudding. Um, what he's talking about with the Spanish oleo is a kind of stew. The um, English pudding or, or the English, um, like a chicken pot pie, he's talking about in, he's talking about things that we would call like a chicken pot pie or other kind of like a steak pot pie. That tradition still holds on in Australia and England, but combining all these different kinds of foods into the puddings and the pies and stuff like that. But he does connect it. You see, even there, he connects it to that Levitical law, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament. What you get a lot of on page five thirty nine is his description of the land and the animals on the land. He gives you this description of um, vines, of grapes growing there. What what would eventually come to that are now called scuppernog vines. It's which is a particular kind of big grape. The grapes we commonly met with were black. Those are the scuppernogs. And then uh, though there be two or three kinds of white grapes that grow wild. And Bird eventually grew all kinds of things in on his farm, including grapes in this attempt to produce wine that rivaled, that rivaled like French wine um, or Italian wine, things like that. And he says in that paragraph that starts off the grapes, uh, let's see if we can find that, that section right there. because it's all, this is one big paragraph, and in the book they have broken it into smaller paragraphs. The vines grew thick in the woods, those are the grape vines. Um, the grapes we commonly met with were black. Disadvantages, I have drunk tolerably good wine pressed from them, though made without skill. He's talking about if you could cultivate this wine, if you could cultivate these grapes um, and get them, if you know anything about pressing wine, um, the, the suggestion here is that this could be turned into a profitable business, making wine from the from the grapes of the American South. Then you get a couple of paragraphs where he talks about bears. Our Indian killed a bear two years old that was feasting on these grapes. He was very fat, as they generally are. A true woodman, woodsman prefers this sort of meat to the fattest venison, and he's talking about like wild game is what he's really talking about here. Uh, as agreeable as such rich diet was to the men, yet we were not accustomed to it, tasted it at first with some sort of squeamishness. Again, he's talking about woodsmen versus people who live on plantations or in the cities on the coast and the kinds of meat that they want, like wild game versus domestic game. This beast is in truth a very clean feeder. Again, he's connecting back to the Levitical law and the sort of like what animals eat then reflects what kind of meat you are getting. 
um, because he is saying the bear is a clean feeder living while the season lasts upon acorns, chestnuts, and chinkapins, not like waste food, like pigs and things like that. And so he has given you this almost naturalist botanist description of like the landscape, what's growing on the land, the animals, those kinds of things. But he is also sort of sneaking in these little details about the Native American beliefs and how they match up, like Ned Bearskin's belief about not mixing the beasts of the land and the, the beasts of the air. Um, he gives you this long description of bears and their seasonal feeding and stuff like that that supports them being a clean um, description of bears eating and hibernating and then eating in the fall, hibernating in the winter, and then fishing in the spring. There's also the last paragraph of the bear section is about chestnuts. There are almost no American chestnut trees left uh, because of uh, a chestnut blight that happened. Chestnut trees used to be plentiful um, all over this, all over the East Coast. They were essentially they were wiped out in a chestnut blight. One reason this section is is um, notable and has become popular is because of his like description of the chestnut trees, which used to be everywhere and now are, are essentially extinct. But the big important section is the in the evening we examined. In the evening, we examined our friend Bearskin concerning the religion of this of, of his country, Con and he explained it to us without any of that reserve to which his nation is subject. This is the more famous section of this because both because of what Ned Bearskin tells them about his religious beliefs and like the the notion of ethics and good and bad and the idea the concept of the afterlife, but also because of the way Bird and receives it and interprets it and connects it to other religions, whether it's Islam or Christianity. Um, he told us he believed there was one supreme God, so it's a monotheistic system, who had several subaltern deities under him. So you have this monotheism, but also this sort of like, something like angels or some lesser supernatural beings. and that, Or you can connect it to Greek and Roman mythology and how some deities had specific jobs, like Apollo controlling the sun and Zeus controlling the lightning and things like that. That this master God made the world a long time ago. Again, there's one single creator of the world. He told the sun, the moon, and the stars their business in the beginning. The same power made all things at first, has taken care to keep them in the same method in motion. And so God is this sort of like bringer of organization and structure out of the chaos and the void, similar to the Christian iconography of First there was darkness, and then God brings order to the, the chaos and the darkness. He believed that God had formed many worlds before he formed this. This is where you get the jump, where there had been these previous worlds, but that those worlds had either been destroyed or decayed and died. God is very just and very good. Again, here is the sort of God is ethical, um, and in turn, mankind is ethical. Ever well pleased with those men who possess those godlike qualities. So in this sort of Christian, if you take the word Christian as being like, like Christ, well then he's, you can see the connection here where Ned is connecting. He means godlike, not like having superpowers, but behaving in good ways that God is good. And then he jumps you to the afterlife. He believed that after death, both good and bad people are conducted by a strong guard into a great road. So this sort of the Grim Reaper or something like that into a great road in which departed souls travel together. Till at a certain distance, this road forks into two paths, one extremely level, the other stony and mountainous. The extremely level one being something like paradise or Eden or heaven. The um, stony and mountainous one being like some place of punishment and suffering or hell or something like that. The good are parted from the bad by a flash of lightning. The right-hand road leads to a charming, warm country where spring is everlasting, every month is May, as the year is always in its youth, and the people are particularly the women are bright as stars. In this happy climate, there are deer, turkey, elks, elks and buffaloes innumerable, so there's, there's plenty of space, there's plenty of land, there's plenty of food for everyone to eat. The soil brings forth corn spontaneously, so nobody has, has to work at planting or hunting or anything like that. Near the entrance into this blessed land sits a venerable old man on a mat richly woven who examines strictly all that are brought before him. This sort of this parallels pretty closely the St. Peter um, 
figure in Christian mythology and Christian iconography, this sort of letting you in, letting you into the gates of paradise after first like examining you or checking your record. And then he jumps to the bad place. The left-hand path is very rugged and uneven, uneven, leaving to a dead and barren country where it is always winter. Not spring, but the coldness of winter. You're away from the warmth of happiness. All the people are hungry. You have not a morsel of anything to eat except a bitter kind of potato that gives them stomach cramps. Here all the women are old and ugly and have claws like a panther, which which they fly upon the men. And so people are in like the happy place is all contentment and accord. This place is all discord and conflict because it's, as he says at the bottom of page 541, which in that place of torment, it's a place where you're tormented. At the end of this pass, it's a dreadful old woman. So instead of the old man, you get an old woman on a monstrous toadstool whose head is covered with rattlesnakes instead of tresses. If you're familiar with the Medusa image from Greek mythology, this pretty closely connects to Medusa, the like hair full of snakes. This hag pronounces sentence upon of woe upon all the miserable wretches that hold up their hands at her tribunal. After this, they're delivered over to huge turkey buzzards like harpies. The harpies are also a part of Greek and Roman mythology. These, um, with the um, the bodies of women and the or the I'm sorry, the bodies of birds and the heads of women that fly with them to the place above mentioned. Here, after they have been tormented a certain number of years, according to their several degrees of guilt, they are driven back into this world to try, if they will, to mend their manners and merit a place the next time in the regions of bliss. And so you also get this concept of reincarnation and rebirth and attempt to, like, be better and do better this time in your re, um, reincarnation and rebirth. So you go through this period of, like, scourging and cleansing and suffering, and then you're reborn and try to do better. So you get that afterlife, that cycle. Um, and so much of this is cyclical, just like nature is cyclical in terms of spring and summer and winter and fall and then like um, growth and death and rebirth in the spring. And so much of this is cyclical in a way that matches nature and the, and the natural flow of things. Uh, this was the substance of Bearskin's Bearskin, religion and was as much to the purpose as could be expected from a mere state of nature. This is a central... One of Bird's central ideas here is that this is a natural philosophy, not a civilized philosophy. And what he means is people that are of nature and who primarily exist and survive along with the, the conditions and the cycles of nature, are their, their religion is going to match that. It contained, however, the three great articles of natural religion. The belief of a god, so you get some supernatural powerful being. Moral distinction between good and evil, so there is some kind of, as he says, morality about what's good and right and bad and wrong and unjust. And the third, the expectation of rewards and punishments in another world, both the belief in an afterlife and how that afterlife, how the system of that afterlife will function. Indeed, and here's Bird giving you, a, uh, making a connection point. Indeed, the Indian notion of a future happiness is a little gross and sensual, and by gross, he doesn't mean gross like we was. He means like bodily and natural instead of like connected to the human body instead of like ethereal, like angels or something like that. Like Muhammad's paradise. But how can it be otherwise in a people that are contented with nature as they find her? There being, and then and then he's done with this discussion, and he's saying there are being great signs of rain yesterday. They have to dig a trench around their tent to keep it from getting wet. Um, he gives you one last little funny, he makes a last little funny joke in the last three paragraphs where he says, as I sat in the tent, so it's like now everybody's gone to bed, Bird is sitting in his own tent getting ready to go to sleep, and he says, I overheard a learned conversation between one of our men and the Indian, again, Ned. He asked the Englishman what it was that made that rumbling noise when it thundered. The man told him merrily that the god of the English was firing his great guns, cannons, upon the god of the Indians, which made all that roaring. The Indian, carrying on the humor, so the Ned is like playing along with the joke, replied very gravely. He believed that it must be the case that the rain which followed upon the thunder must be occasioned by, occasioned by the Indian god being so scared he couldn't hold his water. And so Ned plays along with the joke that the Englishman makes the joke that thunder is called by, caused by God firing his cannons. So the Native American guide plays along and says, 
you know, that probably scares the Native American God so much that he wets his pants, and that's where rain comes from after thunder. Um, so part of what Bert is doing here is showing you that the Native American guide is smart too and can like play along with it. You can tell that there's a joke being made and he plays along with it and, add, and not only plays along with it, but adds to it. Hopefully that gets you through understanding Bird. Um, the response paper topic for Bird, it says that Bearskin's religious beliefs contain the three great articles of natural religion and and goes on to suggest and goes on to suggest that the native beliefs are not so different from Islam or from his own Christianity. And that's what I was trying to show you as I went through this is all these connections to Greek and Roman mythology, to Christian iconography, uh, to Islam. What are the connections that you see between Bearskin's descriptions and the images and figures from other religions, particularly traditional Islam or Christianity? So it's asking you to think about, you know, um, St. Peter versus the old man on the mat or Medusa and the harpies in Greek and Roman mythology versus the, the mean woman in the bad place in Bearskin's religion. But also God is this sort of like bringer of order to the chaos of the universe. And he like sets up, sets up the galaxy and sets up the world to work the way it does. So there's all kinds of connections. Even though this is a short little passage, there's all kinds of connections you can see and make here. I hope that's helpful to you in understanding William Byrd. Um, and again, one good way to think about him as this bridge between like the 1600s and the early, that first hundred years of colonists. And we're going towards the American Revolution, but we're not, the, we're, we're close to it. We're about 20 years away when Byrd dies, but we're not there yet. So he gives you that the 1700s and the Enlightenment before the American Revolution.